But here's the deal with friends. See, you, every one of us, we're going to go through things in our life, right? And you don't always get to choose what you go through. But you always get to choose who you go through it with. Amen? Amen? So since this series is titled Friends, I got a question for you. Are you a friend of God? Well, first of all, let's take a look. I don't know. Well, anytime you don't know, if you're not sure, take a look at the Word of God. We see this in John chapter 15. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. You are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. So today's main objective is that we have to understand and wrap the, our minds and our hearts around the fact that God calls us his friend. However, this isn't a relationship of equals. This isn't a relationship of equals. We don't get to think of Jesus as our, just our good buddy or the big guy in the sky when I hear that thing. So you see, Jesus will always be our king and our Lord. And yet this king invites us to be his friend. He invites us to be his friend. In fact, he wants us to see ourselves as his friend. You'll see, but this isn't a casual word how we say friend. I've got some friends that live in that town. Hey, go tell them Terry sent you. They're kind of my friends. That's casual friend. That's not what I'm talking about today. God's put a passion in my heart for this series, okay, that we see him, what the word friend really means. It's a next level relationship word, his friend. And I want to tell you, you know, I've got three boys. And I've got three boys, and uh, let's say Garrett is my, he's my oldest. And, uh, and my job as a, as a parent was to raise Garrett up in the ways of the Lord. Parent, that's, guys, that's your main job. Your main job isn't to be their buddy or friend, okay? In that process of raising Garrett up, my other, my other uh, two boys, okay, sometimes I had to discipline them. Parents, anyone want to have to discipline your kids? For example, one time I was gone, I get home, it was in the summer, and I get home and the boys were home by themselves, um, and uh, they had broken out a window. And I said, how'd you guys break out that window? What are you doing? Well, they had uh, this uh, water balloon launcher, and this thing was like a giant rubber band. You put a water balloon in. They launched this balloon. Thought it would be funny to bounce it off my neighbor's house, Kyle. Only they didn't bounce it off the top. They shot it through his window. And I could tell something was wrong. And they finally fessed up to it. And uh, I had to discipline them. See, that wasn't a time for me to be their friend. Right? You see, but here's what took place. A few years back, something changed in my relationship with Garrett. You see, I'm always going to be his father but something shifted. That next level in our relationship shifted, but now he's my friend. See, I talk to Garrett. I hang out with Garrett. We go do things together because that's what friends do, right? See, that's what Jesus wants us to get through this word friends. It's a next level relationship with him. God calls us his friends. He wants to spend, wants to spend time with us as his friends. Doesn't that just blow your way when you think about that for a second, that the God that created everything calls us his friends and wants to spend time daily with us he wants to meet i wonder if there's a picture of god in the morning drinking his coffee cup at this table little round table and he's waiting for you to show up because he wants to hang out with you you ever waited for someone to show up and then they pull a no show on you you know that feeling inside you're waiting you're watching you're watching and then you realize oh they're not coming and you kind of leave you don't know what happened you hope nothing happened to them but most of the time it's because they forgot or they just dissed you i wonder if sometimes we do that to god there is Jesus sitting at the table with his cup of coffee waiting to meet with us in the morning to get our day going. He wants to hear everything about what we're concerned about. But he also wants to speak to us so we listen because he needs us to do something as his disciples. Right? So he wants to meet with us. That's what friends do. They meet with each other. Now let's take a look here at who Jesus chose as his close friends when he was on earth. All right? Let's check it out. This is in Matthew chapter 4. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fish for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two, two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Picture the look on their, their dad's face as their two sons, as his two sons walk away in that moment. You've got to be wondering, man, what's he thinking? So if you're taking notes, number one, I've got five points I'm going to cover here in a brief time. Number one, if you're taking notes, that God chooses ordinary people to change the world. He chooses ordinary people. Raise your hand if you've ever felt a little ordinary. Anyone ever felt a little ordinary? Sometimes I do, right? Especially when God calls you to do something that's kind of bigger than yourself, right? 
I got good news tonight for today for you guys because you're, that means if you're ordinary, you're qualified. If you turn your neighbor and say, "I'm ordinary," that makes you qualified to be used by God. Okay, these ordinary guys. If you want to want to find out how ordinary they are, look to the scriptures. Okay, these twelve disciples that He chose, man, they had a lot of weaknesses, right? But we know throughout Scripture, God often uses their weaknesses and turns them into strengths to make a change in this in this earth. In fact. These were the guys, as I did a little research, these were the guys that weren't picked to be on the church team. You see, back in the day, when you're a young man, a young boy that is, if you were chosen, you got to go serve in the local synagogue, the church, right? And you, got, you went through one of the sects, maybe a Pharisee or a Sadducee, but you got picked. But if you didn't get picked for that job, and that was a big honor, so fathers love to see their kids get picked, for their boys get picked. If you didn't get picked, you went into the labor side, fishermen or another type of trade, right? These were the guys that didn't get picked, right? They were <laughs> the rejects. But Jesus chose them. He saw something in them. He just knew if he would spend time with them as his friends, he would change them, right? If he knew he could just get it, he didn't worry about if they were chosen because he chose them. Isn't it good news to know that God chooses us? He sees things in us that we often don't see in ourselves. In fact, things that other people have put down in our lives, that if you ever try to tell somebody you're about to do something, and it could be usually it's by a relative because you can get stung the worst by a relative, they step on that little thing God put on your heart, and then you get discouraged. But what if we train ourselves as Jesus' friends to even see past those near us, to stay focused on what the Father tells us to do, that we have immediately follow him, Amen. We see in the word right there, it says that they immediately followed Jesus. They dropped what they did. What would happen if we got to that point in our walk with God that when he tells us to do something, we immediately follow him? You see, they didn't have to go home and pray about it. How many of you here have done what I've done? Hey, let me pray about this. Okay? The Bible says pray about all things. But there are certain times you don't got to pray about it. These disciples led us by example right there. They dropped what they were doing. They didn't say pray about it. Sometimes when we know there's a calling on our life to do something for God, praying about it just gives us a reason to be talked out of what God told us to do. Because that's what the enemy does. He's a deceiver and he's a liar. And when God puts something on your heart, he's hoping, the enemy's hoping you'll go pray about that, that's something you know you're supposed to do because he's in the, he has a time period when he can whisper lies and talk you out of doing. He'll discredit you. Something will come your way like a financial, maybe you got engine problems. You can't afford to do what God's called you to do. That's why we immediately follow Jesus when he tells us to do something. Number two, friends follow Jesus when it's not convenient. Can you follow Jesus when it's not convenient? Take a look at Matthew 8. Here's a person that wanted to follow Jesus. He even refers to himself as a disciple. That means a follower of God, not one of his key disciples, but just someone that was believing in Jesus. And here's what happens in Matthew chapter 8. Take a look. Another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told them, follow me now, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. You see, guys, there was no one to bury. This dude that wanted to follow Jesus just wanted some extra time to go home and hang out with his family and friends. And when they died, Jesus, I'm going to come follow you then. And Jesus says, follow me now. Here's a sad thing about Scripture. I was talking to Kelly about this. The sad thing about Scripture is we never hear from this guy again. You see, when you... Push pause on your, when God calls you to fo- when, when he calls you to follow him as a disciple of Christ, if you don't know Jesus Christ, and today you're sitting here, I, don't, I hope you leave today with, with a, um, uh, a newness of, and a freshness of a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't want you to put God on pause anymore, because in this story, we never hear from that guy again. Number three, if you're taking notes, to being a friend of Jesus. It says, when they stayed under Jesus' leadership, they became a force to be reckoned with. God calls his friends to be forces to be reckoned with. Isn't that good news? You're a force to be reckoned with because there's something inside you. And I'm really going to dive into that next week. There's something inside you that gives you the strength to do what God calls you to do. I'm going to take a look here. This is Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. Here's Jesus talking to the disciples. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. He's telling the disciples, go do these things out in the commun- your communities. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out scary word. That's a scary word, demon. Uh, no? 
Give as freely as you have received. Don't take any money in your money belts. No gold, silver, or even copper coins. Don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and, uh, and the Lord who worked with them and confirmed his, okay, and, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs. I love that word, signs, that accompanied it. I love that word, signs, because you guys, signs are miracles. It says, look at what it says, and when they preached, signs were attached to it. You see, it should be the normal when the word of God is preached, signs should follow. But American churches, guys, a, a lot of American churches, okay, have gotten away from expecting God to show up. They believe in God. They believe in the scripture. They just don't believe that he'll show up like he used to when the word of God is preached. I believe here at Lifeway Church, when the word of God is preached, you could be struggling with fear, anxiety, stress, a health issue, whatever is in your life. When the word of God is preached, you can be broken, that can be broken off your life just by the word of God going out. Because that's what God says. I'm not hope this is, well, I don't know about that, Pastor. Well, don't get mad at me. Read the word of God. The word of God trumps your feelings. And we can wrap our minds around the fact that his word is that powerful. He can surpass your feelings. That's called breakthrough in your life as a Christian. Amen? I don't mean to preach, but it kind of happening right now. That's my wife. I pay her to see. I, when I say that, I get certain cues when she speaks up. So right on point, baby. But I want us as a church, if you're a part of this house, if God's called you to be a part of Lifeway Church, if you're sitting right here in this seat right now, you wonder, am I a part of Lifeway? I believe God's called you to be a part of what he's doing here and in this community. And we're just started that he wants us coming expecting every single Sunday for him to show up and the kingdom of God to be released in your lives, in your home, in your workplaces. Jimmy, Jimmy and I were talking a couple weeks ago. He asked me a question. He said, what's the kingdom of God mean to you? And I said, heaven. And before I could say part two, he kind of jumped in my chili. Let me tell you what kingdom of God is, Terry. Well, let me finish, Jimmy. The kingdom of God is when heaven comes to earth. And those things that you're going to see in heaven of joy and peace, no more hurting. You're, God wants us to see those things now as his kids, as we release the kingdom of God as his friends here on earth. Amen? Amen. But as a, if you're going to Lifeway Church, I want you coming every Sunday expecting God to show up. The next point is, when you spend time with Jesus, he won't let you stay how you are. See, Jesus isn't concerned about you being comfortable. He tells someone that wants to follow you, Jesus, I want to follow you. What do I need to do? He says, I, you want to follow me? I don't, even have a, I don't even have a place to lay my head. See, Jesus isn't concerned about people being comfortable. He's concerned about saving souls and releasing the kingdom. Saving souls, he wants a big family in heaven, and he needs, he needs the gospel preached, not just from Pastor Terry, but from all of you. You see, when I travel, I take a special pillow. Tanya will tell you I have this special pillow to help support my neck so I'm comfortable. I try to check scripture if any of the disciples had a pillow. They didn't get a pillow like I had. I'm pretty sure Jesus wasn't concerned about people being comfortable. In fact, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should expect to be uncomfortable. Right? Because anytime you're stretched and used, right, stretched, try to do something new. I'm not real comfortable yet. But as you do it for a while, you get more comfortable with it. You get more confident with it. Same thing, same thing in your Christian walk as you're stretched. Okay? These ordinary guys that God used to change the world just hung out with Jesus. Think about Matthew. He was a tax collector, someone despised by the Jews. See, tax collectors are despised by the Jews. Why? Because they often collected more than they were supposed to, and the Jews couldn't do anything about it. How would that make you feel if someone was ripping you off and you couldn't do anything about it? In fact, when they paid their taxes, when they're paid, you probably haven't heard this because this is new when I, when I came across this. When they paid their taxes and they were due change, they wouldn't touch the change because they considered it dirty money. I don't know about you, if I go buy a new pair of shoes and I hand the guy 100 and he's supposed to owe me 30 bucks, I want my change back, right? That's how much they hated tax collectors, okay, because of what they did. They had a bad reputation. 
But aren't you glad that God sees past our reputation? He will see past your reputation. You can't hide behind your reputation when God shows up. For some of us here, we don't need people beating us up because we can beat ourselves up when we think about our reputation, things we have done. But if you allow the power of God to move in your life, you're exactly qualified the, people he, the, the type of people he's looking for. We just saw in Scripture, he chose Matthew, a hated tax collector. See, Jesus knew what type of man he was, but he knew what type of man he'd become if he'd hang out with him. What about the tax collector Zacchaeus? Jesus saw him hanging out in a tree. And when he sees Zacchaeus, he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to go to your house. And the, and the religious people, they got upset. You know the scripture, they got upset. What's he doing with that sinner? Why isn't Jesus hanging out with the good people? The good people, right? But see, Zacchaeus wanted to be Jesus' friend so bad because I wonder if Zacchaeus saw all these lives. See, anyone that hung out with Jesus, he saw what was taking place in their lives, and he knew that Jesus had the power to change his life. You see, he had money. Maybe he was rich. Tax culture, he was rich. He even tells the scripture, God, if I, I'll give back four times as much if I've ripped anybody off. That's what he tells Jesus. But he needed more than money. He needed a relationship with Jesus, and he knew Jesus could change him. In fact, Scripture says he changed, Zacchaeus got saved and his whole family got saved. Isn't that good news? When you hang out with Jesus, he can save you and change you and your family members. So if you've got family members that need saved, think about that. If you can't hang out with Jesus for yourself, hang out with Jesus for them. Because God can show up and use you and change your family members. Simon the Canaanite labeled the zealot. See, zealots were a religious sect back then that often attempted to arouse rebellion amongst the Jewish people towards the Roman uh, government. So what were, what were zealots? They were troublemakers. When Jesus called Simon, what was he? He was a troublemaker. But Jesus knew that he, would, he could shift Simon from being zealous, zealous as a troublemaker to being on fire and zealous for Jesus Christ. If he just spent time with Jesus. Again, once again, those that hang out with Jesus, they're expected to change. See, it doesn't always feel good to hang out with Jesus. I'm going to say it again. It doesn't always feel good when you hang out with Jesus. Why? Because if you spend time with Jesus, he's going to put his thumb on something in your life that's hurting you. You become comfortable with it, but he knows it's bad for you. And when you hang out with Jesus, he's that type of friend that doesn't want you stuck in the mud. He knows his power, the power of the cross, the power of his blood can spill over your thing and wash you clean. So he wants you uncomfortable. He wants you stretched, right? But he also, he also wants you um, trusting in him that he can wash over those things in your life when you hang out with him and dissolve them. Remember Matthew when he tell, when he's t when, in, Matt, in Matthew, um, Jesus is telling his disciples, okay, what's about to happen to him on the cross? Remember, when you hang out with Jesus, it's not always comfortable. Peter's about to get real uncomfortable right here, okay? He, and he's t the, Jesus is telling all the disciples, here's what's about to happen to me. I'm going to die on the cross, but I'm going to rise from the dead. And Peter stops him and says, no, Jesus, I'm not going to let that happen to you. And, and Jesus confronted Peter. I would say nicely, but what I'm about to read to you wasn't pleasant, okay? Take, take a look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Raise your hand if you want to be called Satan by Jesus. <laughs> that's, not, that's not good. Peter was wrong because he listened to the voice that the enemy whispered in his ear question for you was jesus talking to peter or was he talking to satan go ahead, ryan leave that up there you can leave it up look at he says get away from me satan he's talking to peter but he refers to him as satan you see the bible says we don't fight flesh and blood we fight principalities a principality is demonic so peter here's what happens to christians he gets his emotional button pushed boom because his remember his best friends are saying he's going to die his emotional button gets pushed the devil whispers because when, when our buttons get pushed, you ever had someone do something to your kid and you don't really consult God? God, I got this. Take a break. You handle it. 
when I was a principal at the school, I saw a lot of that. Good people get their button pushed and they act crazy. One dude called me the F word five times. Five times I counted under my desk. One, two. Seriously, at the end of it, he held his son and I swatted him. He became my mechanic, my mechanic and one of my close friends. Because I knew his emotional button was getting pushed in that moment, his son had lied to him because that's what kids do, try to get out of stuff. And I just waited and waited and waited. See, when your emotional get button gets pushed, it doesn't give you an excuse. It doesn't let you justify getting out of God's will for your life. Peter didn't have any excuse to get out of, he had no reason, okay, other than listening to the whisper, because the devil clearly whispers to his ear, but Jesus is so good, he saw past what was really happening, and he sees, oh, I see you, Satan, that's not even Peter, Peter, I love you, man, but you're being used right now, and he sees, and he says, get behind me, Satan, you see, because Jesus knew he had a mission to accomplish, he couldn't allow distractions. What if you, as Jesus, his friends, you don't allow distractions to keep you from doing what God's called you to do? Jesus had a mission, and he needed to complete it. See, Peter was wrong, though, because check it out. They had scripture back then. Peter knew scripture. If Peter would just push pause for a second when he heard the whisper, and he'd gone to scripture, he would have noticed that the Son of God was going to arrive, have to die on the cross for humanity's sins, and he'd rise from the dead. If he just would have pushed pause and gone to the word before he did something stupid or said something dumb, right? How many times of us as Jesus' friends, if we'll discipline ourselves to go to the word before we make a decision, right? Do you know too, though, your friends can deceive you? Pastor Terry, if I don't, because I'm deceptible to this, because I love you guys, if you said, this happened to me, Pastor if I don't discipline myself to go to the Word, to take you back to the Word, I could give you bad advice. Actually, I could listen to the whisper. You can get messed up from friends. But if you always refer back to the Word of God, go, hold on a second, I don't like this, but let's see what God says about this. And you go back to the Word of God, I'm telling you, it'll keep you on that path that God wants you to go. Right? What would have happened if Jesus, if Jesus would have listened to his friend? You can't say, well, Pastor Terry, when you get to heaven, well, Pastor Terry told me to do that. I'm going to be accountable, I know that, for uh, that kind of stuff as a leader. Okay, but here's the deal. If Jesus would have listened to Peter and said, you know what? I've done nothing but love and heal people, and this is how they're going to treat me. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to the cross facts. I'm a, in fact, I'm going to call a few of my angels and smoke them all, right? But we would, I'm telling you, we'd go to hell because that's the two places, there's two places you go as Christians, or a person, you go to heaven, you go to hell. But Jesus knew he had a mission to complete. He couldn't be distracted even by his close friend Peter. Right? So it's so important that we always refer, refer back to, God, what are you saying? There's a chance my emotional button got pushed in this situation. I'm going to go back to the Word. Okay? Isn't that good that God gives us a, a road map, a game plan, how to, how to navigate through life? He's not expecting us to do it on his own. But I wonder if, if he's in heaven talking, Father, man, if, if Terry would just go to his Word, I've got an answer. I've got an answer for Terry. He's my friend. Go to the, go to the Word, Terry. You see, Jesus has no favorites. We know that. Ethnic background. Male, female, rich, poor, all equal in his sight. But one thing is consistent in the Bible, Jesus never left a person how he found them. Just because you're Jesus' friend doesn't give, get you off the hook from being changed. Right? Remember the lady at the well? He spent a little time with her, and then he tells her to go sin no more. I know you sleep around, but don't go and sin anymore. Jesus knows sin hurts his friends. And because he doesn't want his friends getting hurt, he doesn't want us keeping on sinning. So all those that choose to follow Jesus, it's expected that you stop doing whatever sin might be in your life. Why? Because sin hurts us, and why would God ever want one of his friends to be hurt, right? So there's an expectation to change. And some of you say, well, I confessed it to God, but you had no change. You see, confessing and repentance are two different things, right? Confessing means I did it. Okay, God already knows that. Repentance is when you stop and you go the other direction, saying, God, I know I was going this direction. I was wrong. I'm going the other way. Right? Confession and, can, and repentance. Number five, as I wind down here, these friends of Jesus, they failed him when Jesus needed him the most. You see, they spent all this time with Jesus. They saw Jesus do all these miracles. Right? You would think, man, sometimes we say, well, Jesus, if I saw that person, 
if I saw their, their uh, heel, because you see, you know, my, maybe their foot's one little longer, and if I could see their other foot grow out the right length, then I'd believe you. But Scripture tells us Jesus did those signs and wonders all the place, and a lot of people still didn't believe, right? But these disciples, they failed. Even though they've seen Jesus do all these miracles, and they also, the power of God had flowed through them. They've been used by God already multiple ways. Remember, he said, go cast out demons and all this other, heal, the, heal people with leprosy, which is an incurable de- disease back then, right? They did all this, yet they still failed him in the end. The last week of Jesus' life was not very good for the disciples. It wasn't very good for the disciples. I want to I wanna, I wanna make sure I paint this picture clearly. Philip was panicking in the upper room, unsure of who Jesus really was. As Jesus was sharing the bread and the wine, remember with the disciples, the Last Supper, what were they arguing over? Who was the greatest? They're still arguing over who the greatest was. As Jesus, um, the night before Jesus is going to be crucified, nailed to the cross, and separated from the Father because he was going to absorb all of our sins, right? That is, he knew his dad was turned away. He knew what he was about to go through. And he says, man, I'm overwhelmed. If you know scripture, he's, he's teardrops of blood. You know, that's scientifically proven. When you're under so much anguish that if you cry, you can actually produce. That's, it. that's how much anguish Jesus was under. He knew what was going to happen, and he tells his friends, I need you guys to pray. I know that you can't change about what's going to happen, but if you pray, I know you can bring comfort because I believe in power of prayer, so my friends, I need you praying. What happens? They fall asleep on Jesus a couple times. Judas, one of his close friends, sold him out for some money, chose money over Jesus. Thomas doubted him. At the cross, all but one deserted him. Jesus tells him, hey, when I rise from the grave, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Go wait in Jerusalem. So in three days, I'm going to show up. I'm going to meet you there. What happens? They go back to their labor. They go back to fishing and doing their other jobs. They can't even follow some simple direction in the end. We know Peter denied Jesus three times. And one of the saddest verses in the Bible, guys, is this. It says, when they met Jesus in the garden, it says... All forsake him. Picture Jesus saying, where's my friends? And they all, they're gone. They're gone. So they fail, they fail, and they fail Jesus. It's a bad week for the disciples. But then they have this encounter with Jesus. They have that but then moment. That's why I love coming to church every Sunday. I love worship. I love the message because I know myself and you can have a, a but then moment and things totally change for you in your lives. See, Jesus rises from the dead, and the first thing he does, he goes and he finds the disciples, and he smokes them, turns them into salt pillars. I'm just teasing. Some of you laugh, you know the word, okay. Um, Jesus does something. He meets them, he loves on them, and he fills them with power, and they go change the world. Say they had a bad ending right there, but they finish really strong. Scripture says they would not deny Jesus again after that encounter. In fact, all but one died a brutal death. Speared through, boiled, think about getting boiled, boiled, nailed upside down on a cross, and you start to think, what would cause some of Jesus' friends not to deny him again and, and know that they're, they're going to die? Because see, God had told them, Jesus had already told them months before that you're going to die similar to me. So at some point, they knew, I was thinking about this morning, they had to know, they had to start to connect the dots, that at some point, they're going to die, they're going to be murdered. What would cause some of his friends to know they're going to be murdered, to stick it out till the very end? You see, they had an encounter with Jesus. And that's what I want us to know today, is that Jesus, he's not just our friend. He's the friend. And when the, the friend shows up in your life, he'll fill you full of boldness to do things you couldn't think you could do. One moment you're denying Jesus three times, next you're standing witnessing and 3,000 people get saved. Why and how? Week two, next week I'm going to talk about this, how to live that empowered life, how to be that friend that Jesus wants us to be. If you close your eyes, let's, let's close in prayer. Father, remind us when we leave today that we're your friends. Father, we know that you take good care of your friends. Our worries, our concerns, Give us strength not to worry about stuff, but to lay it at the cross and trust that you're a good daddy and you're going to take care of us. Here's some good news for you. Your relationship with Jesus is not based off your love for him, but his love for you. 
you're a best friend material. You need to know that today, that you are best friend material. We all have sinned and deserve God's judgment. God the Father sent his only son to satisfy that judgment for those who believe in him. Jesus, the creator and eternal son of God who lived a sinful life, loves us so much that he died for our sins, taking the punishment that we deserve. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your life, it's time for you to take that next step, that next level. You may know about him, but do you really know him? If you know him, you serve him. If you know him, you've asked him to be the Lord of your life. If you've never done that, man, I want you to get that today. It's super easy. If you feel something knocking at your heart, I promise you, that's the Holy Spirit saying, time to come home. Surrender your life to me. I'm going to be that friend that never lets you down. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, ain't nobody looking around. This is between you and God. Just slip your hand up and say, yes, Pastor. Today, I want Jesus to come into my heart. I need him. I need that kind of friend. Anyone today? Father, we thank you so much for your word, your promises. You, tell, you call us your friends. I just pray that every person here, Father, would go out this week and they would know when things kind of rally up against them, they've got stuff at home or at work or whatever it might be, that they're your friend and you protect your friends. So I pray blessings and protection over your friends today. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we're going to have a prayer. Our prayer team's going to come up here. And uh, if you need prayer over anything, would you let these, these friends pray with you? We know God is here and he's listening. You've got a big decision. You've got something you need prayed over. Maybe you want to come pray for a, a, a sibling, a friend, a relative that needs to know Jesus or needs healed or something. We believe God still heals. He's what he's good at. Don't miss this moment.